Hi, today we're talking to Sandra Rodriguez Barron, a Latina novelist and writing teacher, about how writers can land a deal and what it means to be a writer of color in America today. Sandra is the author of The Heiress of Water, winner of the International Latino Book Award for Debut Fiction, and the novel Stay With Me. She was the recipient of a Breadloaf Fellowship and a National Association of Latino Arts and Culture grant. She was born in Puerto Rico, lived in the Dominican Republic and El Salvador, and now lives with her family in Connecticut. She teaches in the MFA program at Western Connecticut State University at the Westport Writers Workshop and writes for CNN.com. So Sandra, thank you for coming today. Thank you so much for inviting me, Tess. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, it's fun. Um, so first of all, we have our cocktail, which is already made up today. And we have some white wine, some delicious Cabot, which is very light and refreshing. And we've mixed it with, um, actually with lemonade and you can use diet lemonade if you're watching calories and we have in the pitcher already we've got frozen chunks of pineapple and mango which are exports from the Dominican Republic so that seemed appropriate <laughs> and we've called it Sister Juana's Sangria and we're not going to tell you why because you have to read the book stay with me to find out the significance of this character so okay would you like to pour for us and the sister part is a nun Yes, exactly. <laughs> She's a nun, and this is her cocktail. Okay. Okay. Yum. So this is not too terribly um, alcoholic, and if, if you want to add a kick, you can always put some rum in, um, but this is just a nice light, here, I'll take that, a nice light cocktail yes, to extend lovely. our summer days there. Yes. I have the bits with... Let's give it a go. Cheers. Cheers. Chin, chin, chin. Chin, chin. The recipe's on the website, so <laughs> we'd like to try it. Mm. Mm. Very, very light and lovely, very yep. summery. Yep, mm -hmm. very easy mm -hmm. to make and, and almost nutritious <laughs> with yeah. the fruit. Yes. So today we're talking about Stay With Me, which is Sandra's book. Um, and the first question I have for you is how did you come up with this idea? Tell us a little bit about it and what made you think of this? Sure. Um, I was actually in the process of writing a different novel. The only character, there was one character that was um, always going to be a part of the project, um, but it was going to be more, I want to say, it was lighter, uh, more romantic perhaps. I think it's still a romantic book, mm -hmm. but uh, lighter. Which character was it? It was the brother that's the singer. Oh, Adrian. Yes, yes, that makes sense. Adrian. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, yes. And then um, all of a sudden, um, I had a dear friend of mine, someone my own age, was diagnosed with brain cancer, mm -hmm. and just a few months later, my father was diagnosed with the same kind of rare uh, a brain cancer. And oh, wow. so it was just a case of life taking me in another direction. I found myself googling. Um, you know, brain cancer all the time as I'm writing this other book. So there was this disconnect mm -hmm. um, between what was in my heart and what was in my mind. Mm. So um, what I really, when I started to make the connection that I could perhaps write about this in uh, a family story and a love context was, well, two things. One, I, I began to become fascinated with the sort of neurological oddities yes. and the idea yeah. that your memories are always in your brain, they're just not accessible. And that's fascinating, that information about how the brain works. Yes, yeah. and so, um, and then, and so the idea that somebody, uh, a foundling, a child who, who know, doesn't know where they came from, mm -hmm. that all of a sudden this information would begin to slowly be released would be amazing. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing was my friend wasn't married. And I believe he had been dating someone at the time. And so my, my mind just sort of um, became interested in this idea that and this wasn't exactly directly from his life, but you my were dwelling I, I, on his yes, experience. I was, yes. yes, and yes. I was thinking about what would you do. Um, and I had been in a very long-term relationship once, and so you kind of bring these yes, things the together, together, the pieces. And I thought, mm -hmm. 
what if there was this couple that were in a relationship for a long time, they hadn't decided, you know, there was this, are, we mm -hmm. gonna, are you going to propose to me? We've been together for a long time. What's, mm -hmm. you know, he's not sure. Mm -hmm. And then and she really loves him. Mm -hmm. But then they he love gets this, other, they yeah. love each other. Mm -hmm. He gets this diagnosis. And all of a sudden, you know, when I, in discussions I've had with people, I think half the people say, well, of course you stay with him. Um, in a way... And certainly you would, um, regardless of whether you had a romantic relationship with someone, you would be there for them for the journey, for as the medical, as yeah. best you could, right? Yeah. But when you have it tangled up with this other thing, yes. uh, and, and she knows she wants to get married, she's getting a little yes. older. And she put six years into the relationship, which was quite a long time. Right. Mm -hmm. So she's got this investment uh, yes. of time and she wants to have children and, yes. and, and, and with cancer, you never know. I mean, people do beat the odds. Yes. So what do you do? And, and, I, I, and I, I love those kind of gray areas of life yes. and to kind of go in there and break it apart and, and to kind of, um, and that's why I tend to go into different points of view because I don't like to make someone like David, for example, um, who, the, the, the young man with the brain cancer, right? Yeah. To to have him just be an object, right? You know, like right. the cue ball that hits the billiards that spread, right. and that then you lose the track of that yes. person. Yeah. I didn't want to use him as a character, so I do spend time in his head, kind of um, processing what's going on to, with him. <clears throat> excuse me, and and what's going on in the relationship, and yes. and how he's trying to negotiate his needs and trying to also be unselfish and, and realize she has a right to a life and a husband and a children yes, yeah, someday. And, yeah. and trying to he was an interesting character, I thought, because uh, you know I enjoyed the fact that you did make <clears throat> him multifaceted. You did show his selfishness. You know, naturally you would be selfish. Mm -hmm. Of course you would be mm -hmm. selfish. Um, and so we won't, we won't spoil um, obviously what happens, but that was actually the, the story question that was in my mind as I was reading through the book is what happens to David, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I loved how you set it up. Um, it could go either way. Right. And just be careful. Don't be careful when you read the reviews on Goodreads. Um, I think it's Goodreads that has a bit of a spoiler in one of them. Okay. There's a little bit of a spoiler, so be careful how you read the reviews. Mm -hmm. um, but that was that was done very well because it was very clear it could go either way. Right. And so that was interesting. But what about the five children? What made you come up with five kids? Because that's a lot of characters to handle. And my first thought was, oh my goodness, how is she? How am I going to get to grips with all these different characters quickly? Because you don't want to be confused. Right. Yeah. So what made you do five? I think. Um... And these are the kinds of things that you figure out later, like almost years after you've written the book. Like, mm. what, what was that structure about? What was mm. that? I grew up um, with a lot of um, teenage uncles and aunts. Um, and so that family structure was natural Familiar. to, to mm. me, that number and that, that uh, mm. you know, and, and also the, the, the sort of... Um, you know that that kind of tension sometimes that yes, you know the yes, pecking order and all done. that yes, you know yes, so yes. and I've always lamented not being from a lot I always wanted a lot of brother, brothers and sisters I have one brother who's okay. 10 years almost nine years younger than me oh. so I grew yeah. up an only child so yeah. I think a lot of some of what I write is based on what I long for. Wish fulfillment. Yes, yeah. Yes, so I got yeah. to be with this family for yes. the year and a half it took me to write it. Yeah. Um, yeah. They became my own. Yes. And no, that's a, one of the nice things about being a writer, isn't it? And then um, also lovely was the Thimble Islands and the description of the house and um, the Thimble Islands is not far from us here and I've been there. Um, and so that was fascinating to see the sort of mini Kennedy-esque type plan yeah um, and the, and there was tremendous humanity in the depictions of that clan and also throughout the whole book I thought um, so tell me in terms of writing a novel what do you find the hardest and how do you get over it I think uh, well there's two things um, I would say negotiating um, structure and um, having a plan mm -hmm. and then abandoning it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So letting the, the, the story do what it needs to do and let the scaffolding fall, fall off. And I've heard people talk about not writing from what you know, but writing toward understanding something. And you have to have a tolerance for uh, a um, non-linear kind of thinking. Feeling like you might be wasting your time. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah. You have to have faith that this is going to come together. And I think you only get that faith through years of writing. <laughs> and so was, were there times when you didn't write, when you, know, you knew you should be writing because of that? Or did that, it didn't bother you to that extent? Um, yes, early on I would get very disappointed and frustrated, but one of the things that I think every writer should do is to um, continue writing, um, not necessarily on a project, but have a separate file. Mm -hmm. I call them buckets. Mm -hmm. So I have these files that are like family life, marriage, friendship, uh, parenting and I just any thought that I have I put it in there uh -huh. and so it kind of and, and sometimes I don't even go back to it for a year right. and then you know but writing has this wonderful th the tendency to age in a way that it, sometimes you don't even remember mm -hmm. writing yeah. it's like mm -hmm. a like a stranger gave you this yep. gift of a line yes. yeah. um, and I think to continue building that inventory when you're frustrated with a a project, a short story or a novel you're working on, go back to these um, buckets of, of, of yes. creative goodness yeah. that you have, things that, 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 that matter to you. Mm -hmm. And um, you, could, you, can, you can draw on them. Yes, you yeah. could yeah. make them into articles or mm -hmm. personal essays, or you can turn it into fiction. Right, so it won't necessarily be wasted. Right, yeah. right. And, and how about in your working day? You have a family, you have, um, you have kids at home still? Yes, yeah. I do. I have cool. a 10-year-old son. Oh. So, um, yeah. yeah there's... So you're still busy with, with school routines. and So how do you approach your writing? Well, um, typically I just use those hours that he's in school and then like so many other writer moms that I've heard on this show too, you know, you, you, you're, you, know, you, you're, you shift and you have a completely different role and it's over for the day. Um, I recently reread, this is a new thing, I guess I, it's an, a, an a, it's, you reach a certain age when it's time to reread certain books. Mm -hmm. um, so I've started doing that and, and, and I'm just amazed at what happens. Anyway, I just reread Michael Cunningham's The Hours. Oh. And he talks about Virginia Woolf mm -hmm. and how she would get up in the morning and try to avoid contact with anybody because it would burst this delicate yes. membrane. Yes. And um, when I read that, I put it down and I thought, I have to get up Early. at 5.30 yes. in the morning and have that hour um, to... And did you? I did, I did. I just interrupted it because I have house guests right now. Okay. But um, wow. I'm going to go back to it. I, I did it for a month and I've been doing this throughout my life. I fall mm -hmm. off. It's not yeah, natural to me. <laughs> you start and you stop and you start again. The point yes. is starting again. Yes. It doesn't matter if you stop, but you just do need to start again. Absolutely. Yeah. And that hour of writing is like nothing else you can do after that time of the day. It is such a powerful, even if you're tired, even yeah. if you're miserable, the writing and the ideas that get put down yeah. are so yeah. much more, the, the, well, your editor isn't up yet. <laughs> you left your, her in bed. Your critical self is still in bed. <laughs> do you think because you're so tired? Oh, that's hilarious. How to outwit your internal editor. Yes. Get up before she does. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. So, um, so that's fascinating. It was really powerful for me to hear of a master, you know, of a, of a master writer like Virginia Woolf yes. struggling with that too. And, and so, yes, it's absolutely Someone who didn't true. have children, who didn't have to even earn a living. I right. mean, she was, she was wealthy without having to earn that money. I'm always a little scared about um, her methods, you know, because she was, um, because she struggled with mental illness, so mm -hmm. I, I think we have to be selective about how we pick <laughs> out those, but I think that's a great idea. So we could definitely try that. Okay, so um, now when you teach in your MFA program um, and at the Westport Writers Workshop, do you discuss how writers can land a deal today? What are your thoughts on you know, advice for a writer who's got a manuscript? How can they get published? 
Well, there's two ways to look at that. Um, I feel that a lot of people today, you know, hear about these colossal successes like mm -hmm. the Hunger Games mm -hmm. and Fifty Shades of Grey, and they almost think about it as a, a get-rich-quick scheme. Yes, better than the lottery. Right. Um, I, I don't know what to say to those people because they could do it. Who am I to say, I know, you know? Right, I could, right. You don't know. Right. Yeah, so yeah. Um, really what who I speak to, who I... Um, understand are those people who would like to be writers for a lifetime and who are interested in being the best writer they can be mm -hmm. and who are also interested in being read as a way to connect with other human beings. Right. I think if you have that platform um, then you will have the motivation uh, to continue growing and um, so, but let's you know, say... You are saying that does make me, I just want to say sure. that the ending of this book really does do that. It really does connect so powerfully with, um, with emotion, you know, I don't, again, I don't want to spoil it, but the ending I found to be incredibly resonant and satisfying. Yeah. I really did. And um, full of, of wonderful humanity. And so I think you really did achieve that. So your, you know, your focus on that is apparent in this. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank so you. that's who you talk to, is the people who want to write all the time. And so would you suggest, you know, how do they, is it better to go for an agent? Is it better to go for a publisher? How should they? Well, I believe and still believe in traditional publishing. I think there's um, a filtering process that goes on if your if your book it, you you've you've honed your craft you've spent time you've read a lot mm -hmm. you've grown and you've you've written the best manuscript you can um, and you've workshopped it maybe workshopped it that's mm -hmm. the other thing yeah. find writers who are as good or better than you yeah it's better ideally right and and you know you've been open about it and you've just made it the best you can. Um, and um, it's free of typos and it, you know it's it's a it's got a good uh, you got a character who wants something you've yeah. got things at stake mm -hmm. um, all that um, yes then you begin looking for an agent and um, what I did was I began to identify authors that I thought were kind of like me mm -hmm. and I went to uh, Barnes and Noble and, and I, I just opened up the acknowledgement pages and I s wrote down who their agent was okay. and I made a list um, and then I created you know I, I, I got that guide and I went mm -hmm. through the whole thing and put sticky notes and I created a publishers market the publishers mm -hmm. marketplace thank you and um, I made my dream list and I just started going down the line and it was, I believe it was like um, maybe, I didn't get to 10, I think it was like number 6. So publishers, not agents. This was agents, oh, this I'm was sorry. Just, sorry, that's so to agents and then the agent. It's Did they the work with you on the book before they submitted it to publishers? Uh, my agent did a few a few changes, not not too much. Not too much. Um, then because this was two thousand and six that yes. your first book came out. Right. So I think maybe things have changed now. Do you think agents have time to? Is it more important to have a more perf you know a perfect manuscript if you can, or as close as you can as get? As close as yeah, you can get. Yeah, I mean, there's yeah. always you know we all know there's always there's, something. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and and in fact, the more invested you are in its perfection, the more difficult it's it, going to be for the author to yeah. you know make changes yes. if they want. To. Progress, not perfection. Don't right. worry. That's that's a bad word to use. Right. So, would you recommend an author getting a paid editor's critique before they submit to an agent? Um, unless you have a friend or a spouse who's, you know, you, you trust, yeah. um, there are always things that are going to get, but it doesn't have to be perfect. It's about the bones. Yeah. You know, it kind of reminds me when uh, my father, when we were shopping for houses once, he would say, you know, it, it's got to be structurally sound. It could right. be a little cosmetically deficient, but it's got to <laughs> have good bones because you can't fix that. That's a great that. way to describe it. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think also that as readers, we remember 
a perfect book mm -hmm. and we judge every book that we read by that perfect experience which of course is in dreamland right you know it's not reality exactly. anymore so so you're right that there are no perfect books being a writer of color what what does that mean to you and um you know is it easier harder for for writers of color today well i think there was it's changing so much but it used to be that writers um, of color would get put in a separate, I think it was ethnic it was called, you get put in this other shelf. Mm -hmm. And um, then I think as in the last 10 years, the Latino, I think as our singers went mainstream. Uh, really? Yeah, I think as, as oh, J-Lo and, and, and Ricky Martin went, you know, part of the pop culture, everybody else, you know, sort of snuck in. <laughs> and. Um, and so, you know, but, but um, for me personally, I, I grew up, I, I had an odd kind of combination of, of experiences growing up in that my family moved back and forth from different Latin American countries, and, but we always had this home base in Connecticut because I had an aunt that lived here. And so, okay. um, and I also went to an American school in oh, El Salvador. Big, oh, okay. So yeah. I was, I, I think of myself as kind of a cultural chameleon in that yeah. sense. I kind of slipped back and forth. And so I, in the last, in this, in, with Stay With Me and the mm -hmm. one that I'm working on now, mm -hmm. I am trying to folk, to not put a lot of focus on, you know, it's this, it's that, they're from here, they're from that, they're from there. Hmm. Um, I'm trying to keep the focus on things that are a little bit more universal. Now, do you um, think that will get you a backlash? Because very often what I've read online, people love the fact that this book is so tied, the trip to Dominican Republic, and mm -hmm. it's, those details are fabulous. Mm -hmm. And you can really, it's, it's like armchair travel right. to read that section. I loved it. Yeah. Um, do you think people will complain? I hope not because the thing is it's set partly, it begins in Connecticut and the girl goes to Aix-en-Provence, France. Uh -huh. So, it, you know, and it has some flashbacks to her grandmother who is, you know, her mother and her grandmother, and there's the, the mother-daughter tensions mm -hmm. and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But like I said, I don't want to make it about a Puerto Rican, Dominican, you know, that because that, that brings, it, it pulls attention away from what I think is already a lot going on. So is the main character Latina in your next book? Uh, of Latina descent. Descent, yes. okay, so yeah. this is the... It's um, a distinction, because growing up, right, in yeah. Connecticut, I mean, you, you're also a Yankee. Yes. You know? Yes. So. so you're so if I said to you, are you Latina? Are you Yankee? What are you? What would you say if you've got one word? One word I have to hyphenate. US Latino. <laughs> no compound nouns. No. Really? US Latina, that's what you'd say. Yeah. yeah. Because Or dual multi citizen. Dual citizen. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I um yeah. multiculti. Multiculti. <laughs> okay. So then this new character, this is you were very interested in Stay With Me also. I, I thought this was fresh, a fresh approach to um, questions of identity. So your new character, does she have to deal with her heritage, her identity in that way? Um, or is it more universal mother-daughter type of? More universal mother-daughter type mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. it, it more deals with, um, um, our, our romantic relationships, I believe, are very much informed by our relationships in our family. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of you know, the choices she makes based on the craziness back home. Oh, that sounds interesting. Yeah. And are you far along with it? Or? I hope to have a full uh, first draft by the end of the year at the latest. Oh, so, okay. So mm -hmm. that would be out with, will it be HarperCollins again? I don't know that. Don't know yet? Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. But will it take, it's going to be a year, the traditional publishing route, a year from manuscript submission to publication? Uh, yeah, you bring up an, a, an interesting point because I've noticed some of the most hyped books, um, they have a year of publicity. Just yeah. a whole year just of getting reviews and sending it out to other authors. People, it takes a long time, you know, yes. for magazines, they publish yep. so far ahead. And to get, ask people, I remember my last, when this came out, we sent it out like, um, 
uh, I think it was six weeks. That's not enough. I know it's not for enough. People to no. you know. Just I know that typically pre-pub is is at least three months. Yeah, yeah. Right? We, pre-pub. If you're marketing your book, then at least three months prior to the time that it's available. Yeah. But as you say, I mean, it's such a crowded marketplace that I think people are spending as much as they can right. on getting getting a book seen. Right. Yeah. And so I think uh, writers have to have all their all their 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 online presence, mm -hmm. their you know, mm -hmm. be on Goodreads and, yep. and start building all that up. Yeah. Way Facebook ahead of time. And Twitter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You don't have to be everywhere, but you do have to be in a couple of places so readers can interact. Right. Yeah. So what so tell me what is the definition of a writer of colour, do you think? Um, you wouldn't particularly describe yourself as a writer of colour. You no, feel like that. I think it's a sense of otherness, you know, that you're that that you're arriving at a village at some point. Your family arrived at a village that was made up of other people that were in power, mm -hmm. and you were sort of marginalized mm -hmm. um, because you hadn't been there forever. You know, you, the streets aren't named after your grandfather. Um, and, and that's the immigrant story. And the immigrant right. story goes several generations, I think, before it gets erased. Um, the children, and, and I'm very interested in, um, especially uh, um, immigrants coming from cultures that are very traditional. Mm -hmm. And I think, I always oh, yeah. thought Latina, Latina, Catholic, blah, blah, blah. I thought, okay, maybe it entered my head when I was a teenager that maybe Italian mothers might be as conservative as my mother okay. um, but it wasn't until I had roommates that you learn you know the dynamics of other people's family I had yeah. a, um, a roommates from other cultures and I thought oh no you know how what they eat and how what they wear and it, that's different but if they come from that traditional culture there's that clash with yes. the American For sure. you know and, and you always have a friend whose mother's really liberal yeah. you know and you're going what do you mean? You know, she lets her do this. Right. And, um, and so all the things that come with, oh, you know, a parent that is trying to teach you values that no longer work mm -hmm. in your environment. Right. You're but trying to survive. Let go of them. Right. Yeah. And, and what about um, the culture, Latin culture doesn't expect, did I get that from your writing that the Latin culture does not expect their women to be intelligent? They expect them to be beautiful? Well, is that I, too I, simple? Yeah. Well, I I feel that that that's still really really prevalent. Um, I think that um, every country is different. Um, you know, when you talk about Puerto Rico, it has such an American influence. I think mothers and daughters in that mm -hmm. environment are more in tune with each other mm -hmm. than when you go to like deeper Latin America, where it's still you know a hundred percent. Not a hundred percent Catholic, no, but you so. know what I mean. Very, yeah. um, and um, so yeah. And there's always the expectation of um, uh, yeah, the women, mm -hmm. you know, have to look a certain way. Mm -hmm. And and um, was they that have an to... issue for you? Did you find yourself having to work against pressures that you that were uncomfortable? Or? I think so. Mm -hmm. I I wanted to value intellectual pursuits more, mm -hmm. and and. Um, I didn't see women reading or talking about books. That was absolutely mm -hmm. foreign. Mm -hmm. um, my my father was a reader, like, I you know, capital R. You know, readers where it's your part of your identity, mm -hmm. as opposed. My mother read books, right? Uh, but she wasn't yes. a reader, so. Yeah. I modeled myself after my father in terms of um, what he was reading, and it's kind of funny because. Because of this, I ended up reading in high school and college like all these Cold War espionage novels, like all these manly books, you know, The, the Winds of War. Like, you know, I look at girls That's today reading Twilight. Like, I yeah. didn't have a Twilight. I no. was reading it, you know, but maybe that was good for me. I don't know. I'm really up on my wars. Um, but, um, and Stephen King and those kind of, yeah. and like heavy duty science fiction. So you just took from his bookshelf. Yeah, yeah. Yes. But, and, but what a lovely memory. Yes. Yes. Well, there's a song that came out in, I don't know if it was in the 90s or the early 2000s that said, read the books your father read. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah so I, and that, that's what I did. And I, I remember I read, he was reading Les Miserables. I read Les Miserables. It took me a year. But, I, you know, it was like I, I wanted to. So that, that was sort of my 
that was my path um, to reading. Um, and did he see your books? He he knew the Heiress of Water was going to be published, and um, but he didn't actually see it published. But I think he was happy. And I actually had a funny little moment where he said uh, he was not a shopper; like he didn't know anything about retail stores or anything. Mm. And so I said um, I had gotten. Um, Borders original voices um, status or whatever oh, wow. you know how it's kind of oh, like the okay. Discover yeah. program for Barnes uh, for Barnes and Noble. Um, Borders had um, original voices, and mm. so I was telling him, I said, and it's going to be at Borders, and he said, Oh, he said, but when is it going to be in the rest of the country? <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was just going to no. be on the border. Oh, on the border, yeah. I'm like, no, Dad. It's that's a an store. Im- that's an immigrant's <laughs> comment. Yeah. Isn't it? That's so funny. Yeah. Oh my, that's so sweet. And yeah. is your mother? Has she seen both books? Yes. 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 Um, and does she enjoy them? Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, I think um, I think every parent probably reads a book kind of like. Yes, what wondering, is, what, like looking for themselves in there. <laughs> it's funny how those connections, if you're, if you're a writer, um, parents have different approaches to writing. My mom always said to me, you go on a bit. And so now I think I'm the briefest writer in the world because of that, you know, the years ago she said that to me. But we'll cut that later on. Don't that. We don't need that. <laughs> we don't need that bit. Okay, well, well Sandy, this was really wonderful. Thank you so much for coming. It's Stay With Me. And you'll enjoy. Thanks very much for watching. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.